بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وآله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهديه واستنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته The book we are about to study chapters of is as agreed upon all scholars of Islam the most authentic book after Kitabullah, the Quran. Therefore, when we study Sahih al-Bukhari, we are actually learning our deen from the most authentic source after the Quran. Now, usually we would introduce who is Muhammad ibn Ismail al-Bukhari and what is his Sahih, the book al Jami al Sahih, what is it? But I think that this is irrelevant because everyone knows what Sahih al Bukhari is and what caliber is Al Imam Muhammad ibn Ismail al Bukhari. Therefore, the, the Sahih is compiled of 73 chapters, if I'm not mistaken. Beginning with Kitab Bid'ul Wahi, ending with Kitab at tawheed And it is sufficient for you to know that one of the great scholars of Ash-Shafi'i Madhab, Al-Imam Ibn Hajar, took about 20 years to write his book, Fathul Bari, Sharh Sahih Al Bukhari. 20 years, if you take this as a project of a lifetime, it would not be underestimated because what is 20 years in life? Yet, seven, eight uh, centuries after his death, we're still benefiting from his book. So to come today in an attempt to study two of the 73 chapters in less than total of 10 hours is not that worthy of giving the book its level and appreciation. But in nowadays times, it is difficult to devote more than that, especially in your professional life. So we would like to utilize it to the best of our abilities. The book that you have is Mukhtasar. It is not the full-fledged book of Al-Bukhari. Because Al-Imam Al-Bukhari, may Allah have mercy on his soul, he was a muhaddith, meaning that he had the knowledge of the sciences of hadith. And he memorized all variations of hadith. And he knew everything that went into the chain of narrators' lives. So he knows who Az Zuhri is, or Sufyan ibn Uyayna, or uh, uh, Al A'mash, or Al A'sh. Every single one, he knew them and knew whether they're worthy of being part of the chain of narrators or not. So he was a muhaddith. He knew everything about hadith. But like the scholars of his time, he was also a faqih. So he had his own understanding of jurisprudence and fiqh. And this is why the scholars say, Fiqhul Imam al Bukhari fi tarajimihi. The fiqh of Bukhari. In Sahih al-Bukhari, you don't find him saying 
this or that. Do you? You go through the Sahih, it's all a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. Okay, where is his fiqh? Where is his understanding? The understanding is in the titles of the chapters we are reading now. This is where he puts his fiqh in few words in a sentence or less. So when we go and try to study it, we find that Imam al-Bukhari in his Sahih used one single hadith in 10, 15, maybe 20 different chapters. And this is why one gets confused. He remembers that there is a hadith, for example, of إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ So he finds this in ilm. He finds this, this in somewhere else, in marriage, and so on. So why is he repeating the same hadith? Because one single hadith can be used in different chapters. For example, Al Imam, is someone shooting me? So I won't know where, where, where to move. <laughs> Al Imam Muhammad ibn Idris al Shafi'i went once and spent the night at Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal's house. And at morning time, the maid said to Imam Ahmad, is this the man you claim that he's a great Imam? He said, yes, why? She said, he's not a good Imam. I left water for him to make wudu for night prayer. And I came at Fajr time and he did not use the water, meant, which meant that he did not perform Qiyamul Layl. So he smiled. He prayed Fajr. While going back with Imam Shafi'i, he told him about what the maid said. And Imam Shafi'i indeed said, yes, I did not pray night prayer. Oof, you're Imam, why? He said, I spent the whole night thinking about a hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, where the Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, to a young brother of Anas ibn Malik, Ya Aba Umair, ma'adha fa'alan nughayr? He was a four-year-old child, and he had a bird in a cage, and the bird died. So he said to him, Ya Aba Umair, he's nicknaming the child, Aba Umair, as if he has a child by the name of Umair. What did the bird do? So he said, I spent the whole night thinking about this hadith, and I got only 80 points benefited from these four words. What kind of a scholar would come with 80 points from such a statement? One, the permissibility of giving nicknames to people who do not have children. Two, nicknaming the children. Three, the permissibility of keeping birds. And subsequently, hunting in Medina, unlike Mecca. It is prohibited to hunt in Mecca, which means that being a haram like Mecca, does not mean the same rulings because you can hunt in Medina while you cannot hunt in Mecca. Four, the permissibility of keeping live animals in a cage, and this would not be considered as torture. Five, dying in a cage without any shortcomings of yours is not sinful because this is from Allah, unlike the cat that was kept at the woman's house until she died, Allah admitted her to hell because that was a sin. And he went on listing 80 points from this hadith. Therefore, the scholars used to do this. They would not simply come to a hadith, learn what it means, the interpretation of words, and move on. They would try to milk that hadith for every single bit of information that would benefit them into getting into Jannah. This is ilm. Ilm is not only to know. Because if ilm was to know, shaitan would be the biggest scholar. Wouldn't he? Iblis was with the angels, not from the angels. Allah stated clearly, a lot of the Muslims have confusion. 
Iblis was not from the angels, he was from the jinn. But he was upgraded to a level where he was with the angels and was commanded to prostrate to Adam, but he refused. Would anyone accuse him of not knowing? Maybe he was negligent, maybe he was absent-minded. No, he knew. Therefore, knowledge is to understand it from all types and directions and to implement it in our lives. So we have two chapters to study. One quite long, which is Kitabul Al-Iman. You're organizer, you should not speak. <laughs> it's there, it's gone. Huh? Kitabul Iman. And then we have a short chapter, which is Kitabul I'tisam. Being short does not mean it is of lesser significance, but this is the hadiths in it. And I pray to Allah that we benefit from this course in a sense that we get closer to Allah, that we increase our knowledge, and that we implement this knowledge in our lives. Okay, who will read? Tfadda. <coughs> Uh, chapter one. Islam is based on five principles. The, the, before chapter one, does it say in the book something? Book of belief. Book of belief. We would like to begin with this issue. Book of belief. In Arabic, it's called Kitabul Iman. So, as an introduction. What do we know about Iman? Iman, as in the famous hadith of Jibreel. We know that when Jibreel came to the Prophet والسلام, he asked him about few things. What is Islam? What is Iman? What is Ihsan? And then he asked him about the hour. At the conclusion, Prophet said والسلام, هذا Jibreel Atakum yu'allimukum umura dinikum. He came to teach you matters of your deen. So Iman is part of our deen. However, when we talk about the 70 plus branches of Iman, or 60 plus hadith authentic and another hadith authentic, when we speak about the Ummah being divided into 73 sects, all of them are in hell except one. And inshallah, we are among this one. Where is the fault when we talk about 72 being in hell? It is in the definition, the understanding, the implementation of Iman. Therefore, it is very important to understand what Iman is, the classifications of it, and how it is understood by other sects. Where did they go wrong? Now, this would be applicable if we were talking about a course in Aqidah. Then, yes, this would be relative. But now we are talking about, in general, chapter of Iman dealing with the Ahadith in Mukhtasar Al-Zabidi of Sahih Al-Imam Al-Bukhari. So the book of belief, what do we mean by belief? Linguistically, belief means, in Arabic, Al-Iman is to believe. <laughs> belief is to believe. So Shaykh, Zakallah Khair, well, this was very difficult. <laughs> Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَمَا أَنْتَ بِمُؤْمِنٍ لَنَا وَلَوْ كُنَّا صَادِقِينَ The brothers of Yusuf, when they came, they said to him that he will not believe in what we're saying, even if we were truthful. So in linguistic, belief or iman means to believe. In technical terms, in terms related to aqidah, Iman has two meanings. One meaning is the whole of religion, 
which includes Islam, Iman, Ihsan, acts of the heart, acts of the tongue, acts of the organs. All of this is included in Iman. This is one part of it. And Imam al-Shafi'i reported the consensus of all scholars that Iman, belief of the heart, and the speech of the tongue, and the actions of the whole body. It's a full package. It's not only the actions of the heart. Allah Azza wa Jal, when He addresses the believers in the Quran, does He only addresses those who believe in their hearts or the whole Muslims? Allahu waliyul mu'mineen. Allah Azza wa Jal is the ally of the believers. Believers in the sense of Iman or the sense of Islam, Iman, Ihsan, and everything that they do. The Prophet, when he said, alayhi salatu wasalam, Al-Jannah would not be entered except by a believing soul. Was the Prophet telling us that even the Muslims will not enter it, only the believing soul? Or, or he was mentioning a general description. This is the description or the general description where Iman refers to what? Hello? It refers to Islam as a whole. It refers to the whole religion. So it's not a branch of Islam. It is Islam itself. Allah Azza wa Jal says in the beginning of the Quran Surah Al-Baqarah, when he talks about the muttaqin, that they pray and they believe in the unseen, etc., etc., etc. Now, there are people or sects, for example, al-mu'tazila, and those who go their way, like Ibn Rawandi, they say that Iman is only to believe. So under this definition, even the Jews are considered to be mu'mineen because they believe. Also, Jahm ibn Safwan and the Jahmiyyah are those who dismantle and they say that Allah has no sifat. So Allah does not have a hearing ability or attribute. He does not see Allah Azza wa Jal does not speak Al-Jahmiyyah, they dismantle all of these attributes. So they say that Iman is knowledge. And this is nonsense to acknowledge that there is Allah. Every single kafir acknowledges that there is Allah, even the atheists, but they do not say it. So this cannot be Iman. al murjiah they said that you have to admit with your tongue that you're a believer. This is sufficient. So again, without doing good deeds, this would mean that even the hypocrites who used to pray with the Muslims, who used to claim that the Prophet is a Prophet of Allah, can fall under the category of Iman, and so on. Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah, disagree with all of that. They say that Iman is to believe with your heart and to acknowledge this verbally and that you have to act upon it. Yet, acting upon it is not a condition in accepting it. Because if it was a condition, then the Khawarij would come and say, if you do not act upon it, then you're a kafir. And we would share this with them. No. We acknowledge that acting is needed, but it is not a condition in making it complete or making it, let, let me rephrase that, in making it valid. Meaning if you don't have action, it's not valid. And if you have actions, it's valid. No. It is needed. It is required in this part of al-Iman. The second definition of Iman is when it is associated with something else. 
The first definition is when Iman is used alone. So it refers to Deen. We've gone through that. The second way of using Iman is when it is associated with something else as in the case of Islam. So when Umar, Hadith, may Allah be pleased with him, when Jibreel asked, what is Islam? We will have these five issues now. What is Iman? We will have the six pillars of Iman. Now they're used together. Then what is, it? What, what is the meaning? Ah, when they're used together, they differ. Al-Faqir, what does Al-Faqir mean? Faqir, poor, huh? miskeen, needy. When they separate, they all mean the same. He is Faqir, he is miskeen, this is the same thing. When they are together, each one has a specific meaning. So Faqir, who has not, who does not have enough at all. Maybe he has lunch, but not dinner. Miskeen is someone who's better. He has dinner, he has lunch, he has a home to live in, but he doesn't have sufficient funding to make, give him a normal life. So a faqir may not have dinner. A miskeen is someone who's better, may, may not have rent, to pay but he has a house may not have money to go for medication but its kids go to school so this is the difference and there are so many things in sharia in the quran when they are joined each one has a different meaning and when they're separated they're okay such as islam and iman when we say al-islam generally without mentioning iman it is included in it and when we say Iman, without mentioning Islam, Islam is embedded in it. But when we say Al-Islam wal Iman, we come to a difference. Allah says in Surah Al-Hujurat, chapter 49, قالت الأعراب إيش؟ آمنا قل لم تؤمنوا ولكن قولوا أسلمنا Okay, then there's a difference. Because they're used together. But throughout the Quran, which means that when they are together, Islam and Iman, Islam means the actions that are apparent. Allahu A'lam what's in your heart. While Iman means the beliefs that are hidden. So when we come to the pillars of Islam, the Shahada, then we have prayer, Fasting, zakat, hajj. You can see all of that with your own eyes. But when we come to iman, and tu'mina billah, wa yawm al-akhir, wal malaika, wal kitab, wal nabiyyin, etc. So these are all hidden things. You get my point, wallah, you're asleep. Anyone who has confusion, when alone, it all means Islam, Iman, a religion. When combined, Islam refers to the actions that are apparent, we can see, like Salat, Zakat, Siyam, while Iman refers to the hidden beliefs and actions, mainly of the heart. So, this is, in a nutshell, an introduction to the book, which is Kitabu. Al-Iman. We begin with the first hadith. Chapter 1. Islam is based on five principles. Narrated Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu. Allah subhanahu wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Islam is based on the following five principles. To testify that none has the right to be worshipped but Allah and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is Allah's messenger. To offer the compulsory congregational prayers beautifully and perfectly. To pay zakah, that is obligatory charity, to perform hajj, that is pilgrimage to Mecca, to observe some fast during the month of Ramadan. Hadith narrated by Ibn Umar. May Allah be pleased with him. He's Abdullah ibn Umar 
ابن الخطاب one of the great companions of the Prophet alayhi salatu wassalam and one of the great pioneers and scholars of Medina along with Zayd ibn Thabit whom all what we have of knowledge from Medina comes from them too. Now this hadith Al-Imam Al-Bukhari reported it in Islam is based on five principles. One would argue, if we are studying the book of Iman, why does he bring this hadith? What would be the answer? I just spent 10 minutes <laughs> describing uh, and explaining. Because Iman, when used alone, it includes Islam, which is the deen. And this is why he's bringing you the definition of Islam in the book of Iman. Because this is part of Iman. And the hadith mentions the five pillars of Islam. The first pillar that Islam is based upon is the Shahada. But I think that it would be appropriate to read the Hadith in Arabic as well. Because so many times the translation fails or the translator puts some info into it or takes some info out of it so that he would make it easy for you so he thinks. Do you have the Arabic? Okay. عن ابن عمر رضي الله عنهما قال قال النبي صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم بني الإسلام على خمس Islam was built Here he says Islam is based So I'm translating from my head Islam is built So Allah عز وجل or the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم is giving us the example as if Islam is a foundation or a building so the building of Islam is based on these five pillars. Now one would claim and say, Khalas, if I do these five pillars, it's sufficient. No, you can live in a house on the structure of a house, but you need paint, you need windows, you need doors, you need air conditioning, you need plumbing etc. So these are the foundations of Islam, which are one, the greatest of all pillars, as shahada the testimony. Shahadat an la ilaha illallah wa anna muhammadan rasulullah wa iqam salat wa ita iz zakat wal hajji wa sawmi ramadan. Here we find that hajj and sawm ramadan in other narrations, replaced. So the fourth is fasting, and the fifth is hajj. Here it's the other way around. The order does not give any much significance. Narrators narrated it this way, and that way it's the same thing. Now when we come to Islam, what does Islam mean? Submission. It comes from the word Peace, as some would like to say. Islam has two meanings. One, a general meaning. Inna dina inda Allah al Islam. Verily, the religion, between brackets, accepted by Allah is Islam. Which means that the religion of all messengers and prophets of Allah was what? Was Islam. This is the general meaning of Islam. That is submitting your will to Allah Azza wa Jal. The angels are Muslims? Yes or no? Allah ordered them to bow to Adam. They submitted their will and they bowed. Are they mushrik for doing this? They have, this is submission. Allah tells you to bow, you bow. Allah tells you don't bow, you don't bow. So this is the general meaning of Islam. Ibrahim, 
Allah tells him, your 14 year old child, take him down and slaughter him. What did he say? Yes, O oh Lord. And he did that. The Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam is one of so many prophets and messengers. And the common denominator of them all that they submitted their will to Allah, worshipping only Allah. This is Islam. Then we have the other meaning of Islam, which is a specific meaning. And that is the religion given to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa wasallam through the divine revelation of the Quran. And this is different than the other is that in Islam, the religion of Allah, which is our religion, we have five daily prayers, we fast Ramadan, we give zakat, we perform hajj. Can anyone say that this type of Islam was done by Moses, by Musa? Was it his religion? No. Religion of Isa? No. They had their own law. The main principle, which is submission, they all shared it. They all submitted their will to Allah. They obeyed Allah. Whatever Allah revealed, they followed. So they're all Muslims, which means every single prophet and messenger are Muslims from Adam till the Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam in the first definition. But by the second meaning of Islam, which is the five daily prayers, the Quran, the Hadith, the Sunnah. This is only for the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Are you with me? Alhamdulillah. Okay. What is the first? To testify that none has the right to be worshipped but Allah and Muhammad is Allah's messenger. In Arabic, shahadat, to testify. But it is one, not two testimony, one. But here he mentioned two, to testify that there is no God worthy of being worshipped except Allah. And that his Muhammad is his Servant and messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. So why did he make them into one and not two? Simply because one includes both. When you say, I read, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ in Salat. Do you mean only this verse? Or you refer to the whole surah? You refer to the whole surah. So the Arabs usually use a lot of abbrevi abbreviations. So instead of saying, I read, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدَ اللَّهُ الصَّمَدْ لَمْ يَلَدْ وَلِبِي وَلَدْ وَلِبِكَ لَهُ كُفُوا وَنَا أَحَدَ They would say this, I read, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدَ Likewise, I said the shahada. One says, ah, one or two. I said the shahada. أَشْهَدُ لَا إِلَهِ اللَّهُ أَشْهَدُ مُحَمْدُ رَسُولُ اللَّهُ So they usually, I said the shahadatin. So there is no, no reason for that. One is by default included with the other. So, what does this shahada mean? First of all, the first part of the shahada, shahada to tawheed, the greatest phrase ever said by, by a human being. There is nothing greater than ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. But here, this shahada is divided into two sentences or phrases. One is a negation. Ashhadu an la ilah. I confirm and testify that there is no God. Oh, mashallah, you're an atheist. <laughs> yeah, he wait until I finish. Well, you're the one who said it. And this is a problem when we do tawaf in haram. We hear the people, they give him money to say the athkar for them. So he leaves him and says, La ilaha. And they say, La ilaha. In Mecca. They're all saying, There is no God. And they say, Repeating, There is no God. 
And then he says, Illallah. Affirmative. Except Allah. It is not recommended at all to separate them. But sometimes, unfortunately, when we have new reverts wanting to say the Shahada, you tell him, Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah. He says, uh, uh, <sighs> He cannot say it. It's too difficult. So you have to break it down to him. Ashhadu is Ashhadu. Allah ilaha, Allah ilaha. You repeat it once, twice until he says it well. Then, Illallah, Illallah is very easy. Then you explain to him that it is that there is no God worthy. The word worthy is not found in the Arabic. So why do we say it? Because if I say it as follows, there's no God worshipped other than Allah. There is no God worshipped other than Allah. Is this true? People would say, no, Buddha is worshipped other than Allah. The idols are worshipped other than Allah. So how do you say there are there is no God worshipped other than Allah. So many gods we have. But when you insert the word worthy, only Allah Azza wa Jal is worthy of being worshipped. So this is needed to insert. So it would give it a better meaning. There is no God. In Arabic we know this. And this is why the Arabs, when the Prophet came to them and said to them, alayhi salatu wasalam, say, La ilaha illallah, and the whole of Arabia will follow you. You will lead them. You will own them. They refused. Because they knew that the implication of saying la ilaha illallah, that we do not worship our gods. We do not follow our whims and desires. We do not have legislation other than what Allah has revealed. This is too much for us. So they refused. So the first part of the testimony to negate there is no God. And the second part is to confirm, accept Allah Azza wa who is worthy of being worshipped. And this means that anyone who associates other with Allah Azza wa cannot be considered to be Muslim at all. He will not be accepted. Allah Azza wa says, وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةِ الرَّسُولَ أَنِعْبُدُ اللَّهِ وَاجْتَنِبُ الطَّاغُوتِ And we certainly sent into every nation a messenger saying, worship Allah and avoid Tahut. Confirmation and negation. And Allah Azza wa Jal says, so whoever disbelieves in Tahut and believes in Allah, has grasped the most trustworthy handhold with no break in it. And the Prophet ﷺ highlights the importance of Shahadatu Tawheed, La ilaha illallah. It's a statement that we rarely say it except in Salat. We do not say it in our daily routine frequently, but we should. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, man kana akhiru kalamihi min ad-dunya la ilaha illallah dakhal al-jannah. Whoever last words of this dunya before he dies is la ilaha illallah, he would enter jannah. And this is why whenever someone is on his dying bed, we try our level best to what? To make him say the shahada. Now, if someone is on his dying bed, how frequently should I tell him to say La ilaha illallah? Every minute, five minutes, or 15? What do you think? Hello? Every? Every one minute? Once? And khalas, I leave. Ha. Huh? The sunnah is to tell him say La ilaha illallah. If he says it, leave him. Unless he says something else, get me some water, please. You get him the water and say, La ilaha illallah. And you do not directly say that to him. You do not say, Uncle, say La ilaha illallah. 
because this would be a little bit aggressive. Some of the people on their dying beds would become defiant, arrogant, and said, I don't want to say. So what do you say? You say it on your own. Here's the water. It's a nice weather. La ilaha illallah. He immediately would say it. Anyone in front of you would say la ilaha illallah, you will automatically repeat it. But when you say it directly, say la ilaha illallah. And you start shaking him, say la ilaha illallah. <laughs> this is not the way of doing it. There's an etiquette for that.